The bike I'm currently rejuvenating is a 1980 Deluxe Varsity Schwinn. And it has the Shimano FF system. The FF stands for Front Freewheeling. And uh, I'm going to show you how to take apart the front section and the rear section and overhaul it and put it all back together. That's what's happening on this special bonus episode of Featherstone Bicycles. Regular viewers of my YouTube channel will know uh, what I'm about to say, but for anybody who's come to this video because they're specifically looking about how to take apart these various components of the Shimano FF system, um, let me just say, I'm not an expert. I'm not a trained bicycle mechanic. However, I have been um, rejuvenating bicycles for over 15 years taking them completely apart down to the smallest ball bearings, putting them all back together. Uh, and uh, so with that out of the way, uh, I will say that um, I contacted Shimano because I could not find anything online uh, regarding how to overhaul these components. And um, so I ended up contacting Shimano. And unfortunately, they don't have anything in their online system on it because it was sort of right before they uh, went computerized with their manuals and whatnot. And according to the rep I talked to, they don't even have any of the paper copies of the manuals, service manuals and whatnot, which is kind of hard to believe, but it is what it is. So uh, the idea behind the front freewheel system was that instead of the rear uh, group of sprockets being a freewheel, which meant that you could pedal backwards um, on the crank and the uh, sprockets would move freely backwards. In this system, it's the crank that moves freely and the group of sprockets continues to move forward. You might ask, why would they do this? Uh, if you're familiar with the um, Sheldon Brown website, uh, great website for all things bicycles, when it first came out, he referred to it as a solution in search of a problem. But basically, the idea was that if you could freewheel in the front and the back sprockets were constantly moving forwards, you could shift in the rear at the rear derailleur without continuing to pedal. Why you would necessarily want to do that, it, it's unknown. But um, it was uh, something that Shimano came up with in the early 1980s or late 1970s, and it only lasted a couple years before um, people realized that there really wasn't much use for it. Anyway, with all that said, let's get started on the front part and um, I'll show you how to take it apart and how it all looks underneath. So the first thing you want to do is this top piece that you see with these four indents here is actually the base piece that is uh, screwed onto the crank. The bottom part of it is the race for the other set of ball bearings that are on the other side. Uh, but to start taking it off, um, you need to get this lock ring off of here and the easiest way that i found to do that is with a punch it should be relatively easy counterclockwise and it'll start to unwind now when you start to take this off and the piece underneath which is the bearing uh ring for these ball bearings down here um, you probably want to hold the other crank 
on your hand because there are ball bearings on this side as well. And if you just start taking this apart, uh, you're gonna start to lose the ball bearings on the other side. So basically you're gonna take this off and then you're gonna lift the chain ring up over the crank, chain ring assembly, I should say. So this lock ring screws off counterclockwise. And then you'll need a little tool like this Park Tool SPA2 uh, because there are two little holes in this bearing lock ring. You probably could move that with a punch, but the safer bet is a tool like this. Ah, there, it's come undone. Now it's interesting that and you'll see why this is, that that's a cone. And unlike the cones on an axle where they're tight, they're, they're, they're screwed in tight and then backed off about a quarter of a turn and then a lock ring sets it in place. This is different. This actually locks down as tight as it can. And I'm gonna show you why, at least why I think that is. So again, you can start to just spin that around. You can start to see the ball bearings are getting loose. Another thing you wanna do is have two trays ready or containers to be able to put the ball bearings in from the top and then a separate one for the bottom and count how many you have. Full disclaimer again, when I first took this apart, I did not do that. Uh, but I do know that when I first received this bicycle and took this uh, assembly off the bottom bracket, there was a space in between. Um, so it wasn't packed with ball bearings. There was at least a space for at least one, possibly two extra ball bearings. So now I'm gonna take all the ball bearings out. All right, the next thing you're gonna find are some spacers. There was actually one underneath this ring when I took it off, the lock ring. And there you see, I've just slid it off the bottom of that. The second one is right here. Careful with them because they are very thin. Um, they're actually what I would call shims rather than spacers. I guess it's <clears throat> essentially the same thing, but they're very thin and they're um, easily bent out of shape. The last little piece is another spacer or shim, if you want to call it that, that is thicker and wider Now you can lift the entire chain ring assembly up off the bottom and carefully remove it from the crank so that you don't spill all the other ball bearings, which you'll see on the bottom here. And then you see this piece has a pawl system with a ring that goes around that is the spring for the pawls and essentially that's what um, creates the freewheel system. Going to use another container here and take the ball bearings off the bottom. All right, now 
one thing I should have said in the beginning is that I have already overhauled this. So this is extremely clean. Uh, this ring right here is the cone for the drive side bearings on the bottom bracket. So since that has a lot of grease in it, when you first go to disassemble this and you're going to take that first ring off, um, all of this area down here can be extremely dirty, extremely greasy. So it would be to your benefit to try to clean that up a little bit with some solvent just so that you can see things a little bit more clearly. So the next thing you want to do is get this ring off, um, which you'll see that there's a slot all the way around. And then it comes to a little divot here where this has been pressed down and the slot stops. That's where the end of the ring is. So you need to get two sort of picks holding one. There you can get that ring off. And then that you can see that that's holding that pawl in there. There's one of the pawls. And then there's the other one. And then that ring just comes out like that. Now, this is your last piece. This is a solid piece. Um, you need a special tool that uh, slides over here, has four divots in it, and that's this is what that tool looks like. You can see it has four tabs that match the four slots on the top, and then it has two flats. For you to put a large crescent wrench on. You slide it over and it fits down exactly on top. I tried using this tool. Um, this doesn't say Shimano on it or anything so I don't know if this was made by Shimano but my local bike shop had it and I borrowed it from them. Uh, I tried to use this tool to get this last piece off but it wasn't working. And in fact, I started to, it started to slip and I started to damage or round out one of the uh, edges uh, where these cutouts are. So I said, you know what? I've taken it down as far as I can. I've cleaned out inside here as well as I can. Uh, I'm not gonna obsess over it and go that far. So after you've cleaned everything, um, you do not want to use grease on this. Um, I used, um, the label's gone on this now, but this is Phil's Tenacious Oil, which is a very thick, sticky oil used on bicycles. But basically, you want to get, um, you, you'll need something that's high tack, uh, to put on here because you're going to have to place all those ball bearings on here while you're holding the chain ring assembly to bring it back. And then because it's got the Paul system, you're going to have to twist it a little. So anyway, you need all those ball bearings to stay in place. So the last piece that I was able to take apart um, is, well, first of all, I should say that unlike uh, a lot of other bikes where this is an assembly where you would have five little bolts that would bring it all together. This has been pressed or tack welded, or I don't know what the right term would be, but the upshot is this is an entire assembly. The two chain rings, the outer chain ring guard, the inner chain ring guard um, is, is all one piece. However, you can take the 
um, assembly a part that's uh, within here that's part of the freewheel system where here you can see the uh, how it's uh, cut out for the pawls to ride in that creates the freewheel system. So what's holding this in place is a snap ring underneath here. Again, you need to clean this up before you start to take this apart because this snap ring might even be impossible to see unless uh, there, there may be so much grease on there. But the way I've been able to do it is to put one pick on one side of the ring, another pick on the other, and then get it out. There. There might be an easier way to do this, but that's the way I did it. And then from there, the chain ring assembly just slips off, and then this is your final piece. So you can clean all in here where the bottom bearings will run, clean all up in here. And then <clears throat> once everything is clean, you're ready to put it all back together. The other benefit of taking this piece off as well as all the other things is that, of course, if you wanna be able to clean this assembly uh, with some evapo rust, letting it soak in there and then steel wool uh, scrubbing on there, um, it, it's best to have actually, obviously take everything off that you can, which is what I've already done, as I said. So now we'll put it back together Put that on there like that. Get the snap ring in. And that's all in now. Then the next bit would be to have my pawls. There's a just trying to figure out the best way to say this. It might be hard to see, but there's a flat here, and then there's a divot, a round divot, and then you can see that the pawl has that same sort of profile. So the pawl goes in that way. The other pawl will go in that way as well. And then you put this split ring on again. There is that divot there where the split in the split ring goes. So you place that on there. Now, one of the things I will tell you there is that you can see there's a slot on the pawl and this ring goes over that slot, which then the pawl rides up on either side of it. To get the second one in, I actually put the split ring in all the way and then have it sitting down on the bottom. Now I can put my pawl back in and then just ride this up over like that. And now you can see with that spring compressed, I've got my Paul action there. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, put the ball bearings in the bottom. And I will say I counted 
35 ball bearings on the bottom and 35 on the top. Again, I don't know if that's the right amount, top and bottom. I could be one off plus or minus uh, either way, but this is working for me. Uh, the easiest way I found to do this is to just pick them up and let them sit in this slot and place them all the way around. Again, be very careful. You've got to hold this straight up and down. The Phil's Tenacious Oil helps keep them in place, but it's not uh, perfect. And it may take two or three attempts getting this chain ring back on without spilling any of these around. So now you want to very carefully place the chain ring assembly over on top. And it's a little tricky because you've got to, the paws are sticking out, so you have to have it to your right so you can turn it to your left so the paws can move in while you seat it. Also, make sure that the outside of the chain ring is going to be facing down because it will fit in there the other way, but obviously that's the wrong way. So it comes underneath, over the top. I'm going to actually get my hand out a little bit farther this way. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna lose some ball bearings and have, gonna have to start over, but you might get lucky. Like that. So now you can freewheel. So now you can put your top ball bearings back in. Uh, probably the first thing to do though would be to put this wider spacer in because you don't want any of the ball bearings getting down. They really won't fit in there, but they could get a little bit stuck. So this first flat, um, wider, thicker, spacer goes over the top and kind of covers up that space. And then you can start putting in your top section ball bearings. So I'm gonna put one of these in and now I'm gonna bring the cone, lock ring, whatever the official name is, and start to wind that down. Now you will see as you start to get this cone tighter and tighter, these balls are gonna to start to move out to the edge and they may do so unevenly. So you're gonna to have to be careful to keep track of that or wind it very slowly there. You want to be able to tighten this as tight as you can so that you don't have, you're going to always have a little bit of end play there uh, in order to get that free wheel action, but it's got to be minimal. And also unlike an axle where you have the cone go down and touch the bearings and then you back it off a little bit. You hold that down with one cone wrench while you light, uh, tighten the lock ring with the other. You can't do that on this system because these holes that this tool slides into are gonna be hidden by this lock ring. So you need to be able to tighten that all the way down you can um, and then, put this 
cover lock ring, I guess you'd call it, on top of that. And then you can send that home with a, with a punch. And now you've got your front freewheel system and there's just a tiny bit of end play there. So the second thing I'm going to show you is the back part, which is the group of sprockets or gang of sprockets, whatever you want to call it. And the first thing we're going to do to take this apart, and of course you've used the tool, the sprocket tool or the freewheel tool to get it off of the um, hub. And there is a snap ring in here. Again, cleaning it up a little bit will help you see things. And you'll notice that there is a um, indentations here that are uh, similar to what pawls would be in a freewheel uh, or what the pawls would ride against in a freewheel. And uh, you'll see that it's basically going to be doing the same function. So you can get a pick in here and get this snap ring out. I will warn you, this piece here is got a big spring underneath it. So it's under a lot of tension. So keep your fingers on there as you work this spring out. Or actually work this clip out, I should say. See how much that that comes up, that spring. So take that off. The spring comes out. Um, and we're going to lay these out on a long piece of paper towel here uh, so that we keep everything in order. So our very first item was that snap ring. Then that piece and then the spring. Now you'll notice that there is a spacer in here or a little bit of a cover plate. And we're going to lift that up. You actually can start to lift everything off of this ring at this point, but don't do that. And you'll see why when I lift this up. There we go. There's that spacer ring. Now, look in here and you'll see that there's actually two pawls and there's tiny little springs behind them that are pushing those pawls up against this sleeve. And again, that's why I was saying it acts a lot like a freewheel. <clears throat> Every one of these sprockets has this same arrangement on them. And you might be asking yourself at this point, if it's a front freewheel system that allowed you to change gears while not pedaling because the rear sprocket kept on moving, why on earth would the rear sprocket be allowed to move backwards? As you can see, these back sprockets move along that line. The only reason that I could determine along with some other very smart people who have been working on these bikes for years is it was a safety feature. 
and that if something happened, a shoelace or a pants leg or something got caught in the front wheel between the chain and the chain ring, and it was not able to um, pedal backwards because this was locked up, this was stationary both forwards and backwards, then you'd kind of be stuck. So as a safety measure, if you get something stuck in the front and you really force it back with a lot of pressure, these this whole sprocket, well, depending on which sprocket the chain is on, it will move backwards and allow you to get free whatever is stuck up in front. It's the only reason I can come up with. Anyway, you can now lift these pieces up one at a time. And you need to be extremely careful because you don't want, uh, when, when this plate, this sprocket comes off, uh, those springs are no longer gonna be uh, under compression and they're gonna wanna fly out. And they're so small, at least in this shop, you'd never find them. So I'm actually gonna hold my hand over it. But I, I will point out before I do that, that there is a way, a certain way that these paws go in. There's a, 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 a thin edge and a thick edge to them. They seem to both have a curvature to them, so I don't think it matters which way you have them. The curvature obviously being uh, uh, compliant with this uh, round piece here. Uh, but you want the thin edge uh, to go towards that uh, rise in the uh, circular piece here. I, obviously there's a name for that and I don't know what it is. So just keep that in mind. got that first one out and I successfully did that without losing anything so there's the springs there's no there's a little indent there that the spring goes in but there's no uh, tab or protrusion sticking out that it sits in it just sits in that little depression and then again the paw is this way with the short end uh, towards this angle. Uh, and there is a right upside and a downside to this. So keep track of that. And I'll keep each pawl and spring with each sprocket. And the reason for that is we're going to find out right on the very next sprocket. Every one of these sprockets has the exact same spring and pawl, except for the second one. The second one, the springs are thicker and stronger. I don't know why. Uh, it could be that this was rebuilt at some point and they put different springs in. I don't know. Anyway, there is a, um, I'm just gonna decompress the spring there. Okay, so now you can get that one up. And here's the springs and the pawls. And then there's a spacer. Now you can see there's now a new ring that's wider and has the same sort of profile as this ring. And we're going to lift this sprocket up. That spring came out. There's the two springs and the pawls. And then 
There's another spacer here. And then this sprocket. there with its springs and paws and then there's a spacer and then there's the last set you can see this all comes off this last piece There's the springs, and there's the pawls for that, and then there's a final spacer, which is actually just the bottom piece, and then this, which is all one piece. So there's your two rings. Um, these are for, I think, the bottom two, and these are for the top three. So now we're going to clean all that up and uh, put it all back together. What I'm going to use to clean it is just a toothbrush and a bowl of solvent here. And then I'm going to hit it up on the wire wheel. But I'm doing this just to get all the major dirt off. To clean my parts on a wire wheel, I'm using uh, a bench grinder. This is a variable speed bench grinder, and I've always got it on the lowest speed. Okay, so we've got everything cleaned up, and now we're going to put it back together. So you've got this base piece, this ring, it's easy to figure out which side is up and down. There's little tabs that protrude out. And then there's two slots on the bottom. So the, the tabs point down. And then they fit into those slots. The first ring goes on. Uh, there's two sides. One's flat. One has a, uh, a divot in it, and you want to put that divot side up. To put the springs in, um, I should say to put the pawls and the springs in, again, you want this thin side to go towards the ridge, I guess you would call it. And hopefully you're going to be able to see this. You have to get a small tweezers and compress the spring and then have something else to push it down in there. and not have it fly around like that. Well, let's just try it like this. You do want to have the opening lined up with the ridge here because you'll have the maximum amount of room to put the spring in. It's tricky and it's going to take, some, take a while and a lot of patience. There we go. There we 
there's one. There's two. Now, you want to probably put a little drop of Phil's Tenacious Oil or any kind of sticky heavyweight oil. On that piece, on those two paws. Uh, the next part is this spacer and this goes there's a side that has another a divot in it well it's easy to tell the spacers because the spacers have the same profile as the um, Paul ring I don't know what you call it but uh, it can't go the other way it doesn't fit so it's got to go this way And then the next um, sprocket, I don't know if this matters, but I'm putting them alternate. So there's only two uh, Pauls on each one, and I'm going to put them opposite. So it's that way. They're here and here, so they're here and here. They're about 180 degrees right there. And now we got to get our, oh no, I lost the spring. Had a panic, panic attack there. I thought I lost one of my springs. All right, so this is going to go this way. This is, these are about 180 degrees from the other ones. And they're going to go in there. All right, now. Got my Paul. There's that one. A little drop of fills. Okay. Again, the spacer ring only goes on one way, right about here. You'll know you've got this right if this third sprocket is even with the edge of this larger section. Three down, two to go. Okay. Got the look again. Okay, so this one's going to go this way. Okay, last one. Ah, this one, this one fits very snugly in the bottom side of this last sprocket. So it's probably best to push that on there. Go. There we go. Okay, now this spacer ring goes in like that. 
I don't know if it matters, but there's kind of an outside edge to this spring and an inside, if that makes sense. This, this bottom part is smaller in diameter than this part. And when I took it apart, I knew that that was smaller part was on the bottom. Now, when you go to put this on, it's tricky because you've got to get, you got to keep that pressure on there with both hands and get the ring on with another hand. You need it. You need a couple extra hands, basically, is what happens here. That is in there. Hope you found this video useful. And if you did, please consider subscribing and follow me as I fully document the rejuvenation process on Featherstone bicycles. <music>